Good morning, everyone. Here we are on the second to the last day of session. <laughs> Boy, have I needed this session. I can tell you it's helped me tremendously with all of the events going on, right? So much suffering in the world. I'm going to start with this Trungpa Rinpoche quote again that I uh, that I read at the at my talk two days ago. It's a, this talk is a continuation of that one. The Mahayana brings greater vision and greater action. Heroism, celebrations, and excitement are all solidly a part of it. You begin to like your environment and as egoless as you may be, you begin to like yourself. The appreciation of the world outside is called compassion and the appreciation of yourself is called Maitri. Unless the two are working together, it is a dead end. I just love that. Unless the two, compassion for the world and appreciation of yourself are working together, it is a dead end. So when we sit on the cushion, you know, we're sitting for ourselves, we're sitting for the whole world because we're not separate. And so when I heard about what happened in Atlanta, I was actually very shocked and upset. And angry. <laughs> angry. A part of me was really angry. <laughs> and really sad as well. Both of those. And of course, it's easy to appreciate the world when everything is rosy, right? You're out in nature, it's all good. And how do we appreciate the world when it's crazy? How do we bring forth compassion during these times. So I don't usually look at news during session because I, you know, I hardly look at news actually because it's mostly bad news and, uh, you know, I don't see the point in it. <laughs> so. So I actually don't watch the news that much, but my husband watches it a lot and fills me in with what I need to know. <laughs> and uh, so when he told me about this a, a couple days ago, I guess it happened, I was uh, upset. And then I heard uh, the, the women, um, 
there were eight killed, seven were women, one was a white male, one was a white woman, four of the six were Asia, uh, well, six were Asian women, four of them were Korean, and it looks like two were Chinese women. So when I heard that the 21 year old white male, you know, blamed the businesses for his sexual addiction, I was outraged. And then when I heard the sheriff in that county say, you know, well, he really had a bad day. <laughs> I was just kind of uh, with disbelief. And uh, then I also saw in the media, you know, they weren't sure if this was a hate crime. Well, if killing eight people is not a hate crime, I don't know the definition of hate crime. When I read the New York Times article on the shooting that ended, it ended, uh, it was a very good article, you know, very balanced. And then it ended with this couple of paragraphs. Rita Barron, 47, the owner of Gabby's boutique next door was with a group of onlookers standing near a used car lot. She said she had been with a customer when she heard noises through the wall that sounded like claps and then women screaming. She called 911 and soon saw victims being taken out by police officers. Nearby, a wail of anguish went up from another cluster of people waiting for any news. Three dropped to the pavement, two of them embracing and shaking as they cried. So I just lost it there. And uh, another article, Stephanie Cho, who's the executive director of the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta, she said, we're calling on our allies across communities of color to stand with us in grief and solidarity against racist violence in all its forms. And I thought we have allies in the white community as well. Uh, the San Francisco Zen Center held a memorial and well being ceremony this morning, right after their Zazen, which I attended. It was on Zoom, and that was eight. 30, 8.35 our time, so right after breakfast. And they chanted uh, the um, Enmei Juku Kanongyo, which we chant, we've been chanting every morning. They chanted this for uh, seven times. And then they also chanted the Daishin Darani. And we used to, uh, in Hawaii and a little bit uh, while we were in the Humphrey house, we used to chant this instead of the sutra reading after the afternoon sit. And like Shikan did mention this yesterday about Dharanis, you know, it's hard to translate them. They're kind of like mantras, almost like magical incantations. 
and the sound of the words are supposed to, you know, just do something. And it's hard to translate unless you know the original, you know, Chinese or, or Indian translation, which was, you know, a couple thousand years ago or maybe a thousand years ago. So it's hard to translate. But the Daishin Dharani does mean the great compassionate mind, Dharani. So that was beautiful to chant it with them on Zoom. And at the end, you know, they do a dedication, like we do a dedication. So I wrote, it was so beautiful. I again was weeping when they were doing this dedication. So I emailed my friend David Zimmerman at the San Francisco Zen Center. I said, is there a way for me to get this dedication that I can share it with my Sangha? And sure enough, just before 10 o'clock, he sent me the dedication, which I would like to read to you. Actually, they chanted it, so I will chant it. In Buddha's diamond realm, the sun of wisdom shines without ceasing. The sweet sound of Dharma soothes every spirit like cooling water. With full awareness, we have chanted the Enme Juku Kananyo and the Daishin Dharani for protecting life. May Buddha with infinite compassion illuminate this endless field. We dedicate this merit and virtue to the peace and the peace, well-being and safe passage of the victims known and unknown of the recent acts of anti-Asian violence and hate and to their families, friends and communities who intimately mourn their losses the peace, safe passage, and well-being of all those of Asian and Pacific Islander descent who are now and throughout the course of American history have suffered due to racially motivated acts of physical, verbal, and sexual assault and harassment, as well as those who have suffered due to forced relocation, incarceration and concentration camps, labor exploitation and other forms of systemic oppression and exclusion. The healing and turning of those whose damaged hearts and clouded minds perpetuate the endless cycles of suffering through the continuation of racially motivated acts of harm and violence to the present time. May these words of dedication help heal this world of pain and confusion for the sake of all living beings. May we, with every act of body, speech, and mind, dedicate ourselves to clear seeing, peacefulness, and nonviolence, so that the power of human goodness and kindness will overcome acts of human cruelty and delusion. And may we and all Buddhas find solace and strength in Buddha's way. Let's do that, all Buddhas. All Buddhas throughout space and time. All Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, Mahaprajna Parami.
So the spiritual path is so important, right? How do we see people for who they are and not for who we project some idea of onto, right? You know, can we live in a world of openness, empathy, and clarity amidst life where you want to just close up and clam up and hide, lock the doors, which I did last night, <laughs> you know, uh, right, how do we see reality as it is? How do we awaken from the three poisons of greed, anger, and ignorance, right? And as Trungpa says, you know, there are obstacles, right? We can overcome them. How do we see all humans as, you know, we're skin, bones, blood, we just may have different coloring, like different flowers in a field. And uh, in our foundation series, Roshi put together such a great foundation series because we're learning about projections, right? How we're trying to make this self the self of ours that we worked hard at creating, so solid by projecting all the things we don't like about ourselves. All of these ideas we've maybe been taught when we were young, we're not comfortable with, so we project it out. We're not comfortable with anger, so we project it out. It's them, not me that's angry, it's them. It's them that's doing bad things and I'm gonna do something about it. Instead of looking here, right here, which is not easy. That's what we're doing on the cushion. We're deeply listening to ourselves, deeply. And we're noticing, ooh, I notice I do not like this about me. Hmm. And I love Natalie Goldberg's suggestion. Can you locate that part that you do not like about you somewhere on your body, maybe on your head? Can you, look, can you pinpoint it? That's difficult to do but our practice of mindfulness helps you to be precise with how you're feeling and where it could possibly be on your body. Then you can see, oh, okay, I can see a part of me as the inner critic there, or the perfectionist. That's not all of me. I think you should try, give it, you know, try it out, see if it works for you. I decided, I decided, I felt when I was feeling some fear, what part of my head was lighting up there that I felt the fear? And it felt like over here. So it's not all of me that is fearful, but there's this part of me that is. <laughs> Although, you know, if, you know, the situation calls for getting out of a certain place, that fear is lighting up for a reason, you're gonna run for self-preservation, absolutely. But if it's another kind of fear, Maybe you're fearful of what somebody might think or say. 
that kind of fear I think you can work with. Okay, what's lighting up? Where is it lighting up in my body? Instead of just being 100% in that fear, just having a little pause, you can step back and observe what you're doing or thinking or feeling. That's the gift of mindfulness meditation, to be precise about your experience. So you can work with it. You've got a brain and a good one, so let's use it. <laughs> Instead of only like ruminating or fantasizing, you know, we can use it for other purposes too. <laughs> So fear came up for me. So I thought, oh, this is a good thing to talk about fear today. And I was remembering a lot because I started to write, you know, I'm working with, um, I'm in Natalie Goldberg's wonderful six week writing, the way of writing intensive. And so I'm starting as I write things down, I'm starting to remember things from the past, which is really cool, actually. I'm, you know, before I totally forget it all, I might as well remember it and write it down. I don't know why or for what reason, but I want to do that. And um, so I remembered what I was for, you know, Roshi and I met and tomorrow is our 33rd anniversary. <laughs> we... <laughs> We met in college, um, and then after a year we dated, we went our separate ways, right? Because I was 19, I was like, I'm not getting serious at this stage in my life. I want to be free, <laughs> I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want to have anybody telling me what to do. <laughs> I don't know, this could be the Asian side of me, right? You know, you're supposed to be a good Asian, quiet woman. That's a stereotype, because that's not me. <laughs> Ask my husband. <laughs> so we got back together again about 10 years later. And uh, we had a long distance relationship going. And I asked him, because I knew he had been a Buddhist priest, though he wasn't practicing as such, then he was an artist, a wild and crazy and very good artist. <laughs> so I asked him, you know, what would be a good book, you know, for me to read, like a Buddhist book? Yeah, I hadn't really read. So he suggested I read Trungpa Rinpoche's book, The Sacred Path of the Warrior. So that was my first book. And Trungpa Rinpoche talks a lot about fear in this book. You know, the warrior, right? Fearless. So, but you have to, you have to, you know, be in fear to go beyond fear. And Roshi has been telling us in the foundations, the way to heal fear is to commit to a genuine spiritual path. And these sessions are wonderful for deepening that spiritual path. Because it will heal suffering and we have a lot of suffering going on right now. So here are some quotes from Trungpa Rinpoche. The key to warriorship and the first principle of Shambhala vision is not being afraid of who you are. Ultimately, that is the definition of bravery, not being afraid of yourself.
So that's interesting. Being able to be with yourself, like we do here in Sashin, alone and yet together with all of you. <laughs> That's such a support for this practice. And then another quote, warriorship is a continual journey. To be a warrior is to learn to be genuine in every moment of your life. Boy, these are like koans, would you say? <laughs> How to be genuine in every moment of your life, right? The self we put together, I remember in a psychoanalysis, I did not do it, but I had a friend who practiced it. You know, we put on this character, this armor, this as if personality, right? as we're going out into the world as kind of a protection because we're afraid that maybe we're not good enough, right? So how to find that genuine self, which is there, it's there. And you know, what does genuine mean? I think you all know what it means. I wanna hear some definitions of genuine just unmute yourself and tell me what you think. What do you consider to be your genuine self? Liz? Honest. Honest. Good. Roshi? The one I've forgotten. The one you've forgotten. <laughs> you kind of, it got lost, huh? <laughs> yeah, when I forget it. When you thought. forget it. Okay, good. All right. The truthful one. The truthful one. Uh, curious. Curious. Curious, sure. Sky. Um, open, the one that is open. The one that is open, yes. Jen. Um, um, real? Real, real. <laughs> Good. Learning. Learning, learning, yes. He says, a great deal of the chaos in the world occurs because people don't appreciate themselves. Boy, that's another koan. <laughs> Appreciating yourself. Any examples there uh, that you have of appreciating yourself? I would love to hear them. How do you appreciate yourself? Sky? For me, it's about um, trusting myself and my own basic goodness enough to be spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Trusting yourself to, so that you can be spontaneous. Yes, good. Who else? How do you appreciate yourself? Um, like sometimes blow people off like, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. That's how you appreciate yourself? Sometimes. Ah, I see, at the expense of somebody else, right? You're saying, what did you say about, can you repeat that? Like, 
sometimes blow people off if if they don't see me or appreciate me then i say like oh they don't know what they're talking about ah i but, get it good thank you for that clarification yeah good tanya i'm just trying to love myself as best as i know how wonderful All right, I want to hear something from everyone. <laughs> okay, Liz. Um, not beating myself up so much. Yay. That's the, that's the <laughs> biggest thing. I'm not kidding. I, I kid you not. I'm getting really good at it and saying, are you doing the best you can, kid? Yes, you are. So <laughs> accepting, just not beating myself up. Very good. Myself. Um, recognizing when I have been skillful in dealing in a with a difficult person or a difficult situation, recognizing that. Great, great, thank you, Patrick. Forgiving myself. Dan. Honoring my body. Wait a second, I can't hear you, Dan. Can you repeat that? Honoring my body and my needs. Honoring my body and my needs. Great. Mark or Kathy, do you want to share something? I don't think you did, right? Um, <laughs> oh, you're, loving you're, kindness meditation. Loving kindness meditation. Very good, Kathy. Yes, yes. A good antidote to shame and not feeling enough. Excellent. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, I think... Uh, um, recognizing when I have slowed down, which has led to openness and opposed, as opposed to jumping uh, to a conclusion or imposing my own frame on something. So I don't know if, I guess, appreciating that I have done that, I guess. Yes, good, very good. Good. Roshi, did you say something? Wait, you're more muted. I, I missed the question. I was busy working on some liturgy for tomorrow. But... <laughs> the question is, how do you appreciate yourself? Well, that's a good question. Uh, gosh, um, I, I appreciate myself when I sit, um, in meditation being, I guess, being spacious, um, allowing, uh, uh, letting go of a, a fixed point of view and allowing other, um, um, perspectives to be in my awareness without necessarily um, attaching to either either or or something like that I think is the way I appreciate myself it's sort of like seeing a larger story of myself okay great yeah. great thank you I appreciate the food I cook <laughs> For myself. <laughs> 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 
Trungpa Rinpoche says, the situations of fear that exist in our lives provide us with stepping stones to step over our fear. On the other side of cowardice is bravery. If we step over properly, we can cross the boundary from being cowardly to being brave. And he says, when we appreciate reality, it can actually work on us. When we appreciate reality, it can actually work on us. So, um, I was going to talk a little bit about the paramitas because I'm going to be teaching these, uh, the Zen Life series starting April 8th on the paramitas. So just a little bit, uh, I just, I've never seen uh, anybody translate paramitas as techniques of non-grasping before, but Trungpa Rinpoche does that. So that is also very interesting. Techniques of non-grasping, because we are a very grasping society, right? We like to grasp things. We like to accumulate things, right? So paramita, the Sanskrit word, it means going beyond. Para means the other shore of the river. Mita means arriving, arriving at the other shore. You're crossing the turbulent river of mental gossip and continuous passion or greed, aggression or anger and ignorance. As you go across the river, the captain of the boat is a spiritual friend who has experience and you practice these six paramitas to get to the other shore. So, how they work. The paramitas are based upon not holding on to your personal territory. So you're beginning to loosen your uh, idea of yourself. You know, because we hold a lot of territory with the self. And I know I hold on a lot of territory to myself. So I can speak from experience. Yes, so that's another interesting thing. You know, what does holding on to personal territory? What is personal territory? Does anybody know what kind of personal territory you hold on to? Isn't that a good question too? Yeah, Liz. I, I don't know if I'm correct in this assessment, but would that be a boundary? Your, your yeah, personal that's... territory, your personal kind of boundary. That's, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm, not reading that correctly. Yeah, I think definitely. Yeah, we all create boundaries, you know, walls of what we think we can do and we can't do. Yeah, that's like a, that's like personal territory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Opinions, judgments. Opinions and judgments. Yes. Yeah. Like what? Anything you want to share, Patrick? <laughs> All right, let's be genuine now. <laughs> yes, Mark. I, I'm a lawyer. My job day to day is to is to like you know <laughs> strut my stuff, <laughs> claim territory. <laughs> yes, yes, a certain persona you put forward, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> And when you're sitting on the cushion, you can afford to relax that and let it go and just be you. Isn't that a relief? <laughs> it's a big relief. 
Absolutely. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it's what I'm saying. It can be hard. <laughs> to let go because you, you're, you're it all the, you know, a large part of your day. Yeah, a large part of the, pra- of, the, of the rest of the time is that other practice. So it's hard. It's a <laughs> way of thinking, really. And so we're trying to kind of start to uh, loosen the grip there on that way of thinking. Anybody else want to share anything about their personal territory? I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the ego and um, a tendency I have to put myself at the center of things in my own life, in my own orbit. Yeah, the tendency to put yourself, and as a result, what is the result of that, Sky? Um, certain degree of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. But also, you know, um, in, well, also, there's a positive side to it, too. Integrity, you know, the ability to be genuine and be in touch with oneself. Yeah, that's important because a lot of people, you know, they're not in touch and and uh, they suffer. We suffer. Anybody else want to talk about personal territory? Yes, Kathy. Um, well, as the parent of teenagers, uh, kind of that territory of parental control, you know, and letting go of that. I think. Well, you know, there's a certain amount you gotta, you know, you're, you're the adult in the room. <laughs> you're the adult in the room. That's important too. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think it's just finding that the balance. Yes. Yes. As they get older. Yes. Yeah. 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 What does that mean? Right. You're the adult in the room. <laughs> there's a lot of territory there too. <laughs> Yeah. So when you become a bodhisattva, which actually you all are, we've been chanting the four vows at the end of every evening. You've been vowing already. This, these are the vows of a bodhisattva, right? Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to transform them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to open them. The awakened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. So you're already a bodhisattva. Uh, And so the work of a bodhisattva is really to go beyond habitual patterns altogether. All right, (laughs) there it is. That's our work, right? And it's kind of impossible. It's aspirational. And it's so important to see, number one, what are our habitual patterns? They might be so habitual, you don't even see them. Know what you're doing. So slowing down, shamatha, practice, you start to see yourself, what you do, what you think. Yeah, um, Shikan is talking about the Maha Prajna Paramita, the Heart Sutra. I really love Bernie's uh, translation of Maha. Well, it's the, what he writes in his book, The Infinite Circle. Maha is so big, there's no inside or outside the circle. It's so big, Maha. Prajna being wisdom, right? Paramita is arriving at the other shore. (laughs) That's the heart sutra we've been chanting. So paramita practice is essential for bodhisattvas. 
I mean, it's, you know, you're a bodhisattva, that's why you practice the paramitas. Trungpa Rinpoche says, a bodhisattva is someone who is brave and utterly and thoroughly involved in the discipline taught by the Buddha. Bodhisattvas are ideally soaked in the water of helping others in every way. Soaked in the water of helping others in every way. Bodhisattva, bodhi, awake, sattva, being. We're awake beings. And it's a powerful path because it comes from the realization of your own potential. That you are absolutely worthy. And you have the potential to be without aggression or anger, without passion or greed, and without ignorance, to be a person without problems. <laughs> So there's six paramitas, generosity, discipline, patience, exertion or energy, meditation, and prajna, wisdom. So I won't talk about those now, but I will start talking more in April. <laughs> I wanted to return to the wilderness, right? And um, the Wilderness Act in America uh, was put together in 1964. That's 57 years ago. And in 1964, the world population was about 3 billion people. Today, it is nearing 8 billion people. So, you know, I, I can just imagine the pressures that humans are putting on the environment. Just from my work in biology, I was a biology major. And, um, you know, I just looking at microbiology, you know, you do a little culture and then pretty soon it's like taking over the whole plate, right, of bacteria. I'm not saying that humans are bacteria, but, you know, we're taking over a lot. In fact, um, what... Uh, Wild lands are natural environments on the earth. Uh, recent maps of wilderness suggests it covers just 23% of the earth's terrestrial surface, 23%. Used to be much more. And um, it's being uh, rapidly degraded by human activity. Even less wilderness remains in the ocean with only 13% free from intense human activity. That got me because I love the ocean. I'm from Hawaii, right? And in Terry Tempest uh, Williams book, she says the outer wilderness mirrors our inner wilderness. It makes sense, right? We are all connected after all. Our adventurous nature is intrinsically tied to wild nature. A freedom of spirit depends on big, wide, open spaces that gave birth to our nation and were home already to hundreds of other nations of indigenous people for generations. 
if we destroy what is outside us, we will destroy what is inside us, inside us. Something precious and original is lost. The home of the brave and the land of the free disappears. Madness fills the void. Wilderness is a stay against insanity. The Wilderness Act of 1964 is a prescription. Thoreau said this 200 years ago, we need the tonic of the wilderness. And Trungpa Rinpoche says, again in his book, The Sacred Path of the Warrior, when human beings lose their connection to nature, to heaven and earth, then they do not know how to nurture their environment or how to rule their world, which is saying the same thing. Human beings destroy their ecology at the same time that they destroy each other. From that perspective, healing our society goes hand in hand with healing our personal elemental connection with the phenomenal world. And then I wanted to read one more thing by uh, Terry Tempest Williams. She was in a New York Times. They have a podcast, I think, weekly. So they interviewed her. And um, this is taking, taken from a longer essay called A Burning Testament, right? When the West was recently burning up. I was asked to write an obituary for the land, but I realize I am writing an obituary for us, for the life we have lost and can never return to. And within this burning of Western lands, our innocence and denial is in flames. The obituary will be short. The time came and these humans died from the old ways of being. Good riddance, it was time. Their cause of death was the terminal disease of solipsism, whereby humans put themselves at the center of the universe. It was only about them. And in so doing, we have been dead to the world that is alive. To the power of these burning illuminated Western lands who have shaped our character inspired our souls and restored our belief in what is beautiful and enduring, I will never write your obituary because even as you burn, you are throwing down seeds that will sprout and flower, trees will grow and forests will rise again as living testaments to how one survives change. It is time to grieve and mourn the dead and believe in the power of renewal. If we do not embrace our grief, our sadness will come out sideways in unexpected forms of depression and violence. We must dare to find a proper ceremony to collectively honor the dead from the coronavirus as we approach 200,000 citizens lost. It's now we know over 500,000. We must honor the lives engulfed in these Western fires and the lives we will continue to lose from the climate crisis at hand. Only then can we begin the work of restoration respecting the generations to come as we clear a path toward cooling a warming planet. This will be our joy. 
Let this be a humble tribute and exaltation and homage and, and an open-hearted eulogy to all we are losing to fire, to floods, to hurricanes and tornadoes and the invisible virus that has called us all home and brought us to our knees. We are not the only species that lives and loves and breathes on this miraculous planet called Earth. May we remember this and raise a fistful of ash to all the lives lost that it holds. Grief is love. How can we hold this grief without holding each other? To bear witness to this moment of undoing is to find the strength and spiritual will to meet the dark and smoldering landscapes where we live. We can cry. Our tears will fall like rain in the desert and wash off our skins of ash so our pores can breathe so our bodies can breathe back the lives that we have taken for granted. I will mark my heart with an X made of ash that says, the power to restore life resides here. The future of our species will be decided here, not by facts, but by love and loss. Hand on my heart, I pledge of allegiance to the only home I will ever know. Okay, now before we close, I want us all to get up and I want to do that chant again, Ka'ikukulu, to stand as a pillar. Right now, some of you have not done this before. Okay, so the main step is actually the, um, it's called an ami, but if you ever did hula hoops when you were young, it's the hula hoop movement, all right? All right, so, you are just your, use your knees to push back and forth. Your knees will help to push the hip around. It doesn't have to be big, no. Just small and round, just small and round. And e either way, you can go whichever way is easier for you. All right, so it's just your waist down that's making the circular movement and on me. All right, yes, good, good, uh-huh. Now we're gonna be clapping. We're gonna do two sh uh, slow circular movements and then three fast ones. One, two, three. One, two, one, two, three, good. And this is saying, kaikukulu, stand as a pillar. And it's saying, why be a pillar? And we're gonna do this hand motions when we step forward two times. The mountain. All right, and then we're clapping. One, two, one, two, three. The altar. This is how they make the altar. And I'm your mirror, so just follow. This will be on your right side. The altar, sacred. What is sacred? And why be a pillar? The rock. The stone, because we're strong. And this is also for the land, the rock, we're strong. And then, why be a pillar? For man, for humans. And this one really, I think for all beings here, really it means, okay? So you can back up a little bit and uh, we're gonna chant it, all right? Um, so we just, Clap one time, and here we go. Hey, mama. 
spend maybe, you know, five minutes with any comments or questions you might have. Just unmute yourself and... Uh... <laughs> I want to make an announcement before we close, okay? You can do that. Okay, so uh, this is last minute, but... Um, uh, since we're doing a Jukai on Sunday, I thought we could do a memorial service tomorrow morning and we'll invite, I've already talked to Shikan about it and he agrees. So I think we'll go ahead with this and we'll uh, invite all of our members to join us. They can come to the sit and the service and then we'll chant the, the Kanteon uh, three times and the Daishin Durrani once. And I've sent a PDF of the Daishin Durrani to Shikan, he'll send it out to all of you. And then we'll use the same dedication that Sensei just uh, chanted during her talk this morning. So that's, that's, that's the announcement. Great, thank you. That sounds wonderful. Sky. I just want to thank you for a wonderful talk. And I just found the, the chanting at the end um, to be remarkably uplifting. Thank you. Yes, I meant to say this chant uh, was done by the Native Hawaiians as they are blocking the road from uh, the you know, so five nations uh, who want to build this $1 billion um, astronomical you know, building uh, to, to view the skies. And there are already 14 telescopes up there. And this one is going to be like humongous, 30. So the Native Hawaiians said enough is enough on our sacred mountain. And they have been blocking the road and they've been doing protocol three times a day, this being one of a number of chants and dances that they were doing as part of their spiritual practice. They very much believe in kapu aloha, which is a very deep form. I think it's, you know, the same as Martin Luther King's nonviolent uh, action there. So they're approaching everything, including, you know, any um, security or police who come with deep respect, but they are making their, um, you know, uh, they're putting their bodies on the line. They have drawn a line and they said, you cannot cross. This is not okay with us. And they have 
stop that telescope. It's been at least five years uh, that they have not been able to build, uh, build. And I was there and I was able to do this chant with them. They have a website where they have the words and people can learn it as well. Pu'u Hulu Hulu. Uh, it's what the name of a hill right there where they call their area of sanctuary, their place of sanctuary. Great, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, it's a great one. I think I should teach this more to, this is a great one. Why be a pillar, it's saying. Why a pillar, right? Because it's all sentient beings we're saving here. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today.